The 2019 polar vortex hung around Minnesota a little longer than was polite, so seeing a break in my schedule, I decided to escape to someplace warm. No beach vacation. I like doing things and seeing new places, but still warm enough to dip my toes in the ocean. Southeast United States. You're on. I did some quick planning, made a few reservations, packed up the Prius, and followed the Mississippi River south for a trip that turned out to be much richer and more rewarding than I ever anticipated. As a former historic house manager, I made sure to hit as many historic properties on the way as I could. Oh, good for you, First Lady Julia Grant. Also, getting lost briefly in southern Wisconsin sometimes yields unexpected charms. The second day, in an ice storm, took me through four states, including a stop in Louisville to tip my cap to Daniel Boone. I had admired the work of this woman sculptor. Looking good, Enid. And Daniel. The following morning started in the hills of western Tennessee with a massive WPA dam. And a local gal who totally deserves a sculpture even a bad sculpture. And some deserved recognition for Mr. Dockery. Nice job, Tennessee. Okay, I bypassed the alarming kitsch of Pigeon Forge and Gatlinburg and was glad when the shops suddenly ended and this began. A day of exploring landed me on the other side of the Blue Ridge Mountains, here. For me, Asheville was all about exploring the Xanadu of historic houses, the Vanderbilt Estate, the elegant interiors, the servant work areas, the greenhouses, the landscapes, which even in winter were enchanting. Plus, wine tasting from the Biltmore Vineyards. Down the mountain I went, all the way to the Atlantic shore to get lost in the rich, complex, historic district of Charleston, South Carolina. The antebellum grace and charm was potent. Standing in contrast was the slave market and the inspiration for Porgy and Bess's Catfish Row, now tidily upscale and gated. Sunday morning, so I was welcomed at church here, where, in 2015, a white supremacist gunned down nine people in Bible study in this room. At the mouth of Charleston Bay stands Fort Sumter, where the first shots of the Civil War were fired. A National Park Service ranger gave an excellent talk about the fort and led the crowd in the end of the day flag lowering, which was surprisingly moving. Outside Charleston are several historic plantations. Rice was the cash crop in that area. I had long admired Drayton Hall. The site stands empty and ghostly, but somehow speaks volumes about its past, sometimes through the fingerprints of enslaved children on its bricks. So easy to be seduced by the lush beauty here. And at my next destination, Savannah, Georgia. The regular pattern of quaint city squares makes this a walker's paradise. It's been the home to many artists and has an impressive college of art and design. Okay, the actual bench was a movie prop, but this is the actual location. As the name suggests, 
This house museum is very intentional about balancing the family story with the people who lived across the pristine garden. The enslaved, the enslaver, the slave labor camp. More and more of this was coming into use. The funky waterfront was vibrant with shops and restaurants. Students were building a fashion portfolio. And the past was always present. The past is even the basis for Savannah's most popular and colorful story, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil, though the iconic statue has been removed to a museum. And nearby, the Atlantic. Mission accomplished. Next, through fields of bare peach and pecan trees to three cities in southern Alabama. A wonderfully uplifting story of black pilots in World War II. An old bank converted into the local Tuskegee Museum with a humble historic cabin on the edge of their parking lot and a more impressive residence adjacent to Tuskegee University. Well, let's start here. The state capital was also the first capital of the Confederacy in 1861 before they moved it to Richmond, Virginia. The historic chambers are lovingly preserved to the day the Confederacy was organized and Jefferson Davis was elected president. The Daughters of the Confederacy later memorialized it with this plaque as they did with the brass star on the Capitol steps where Jefferson Davis was inaugurated. This same women's organization also led the preservation of the first White House of the Confederacy and helped get it moved next door to the Capitol where it operates as a historic house museum with period rooms, the typical historic house woes of water damage, and a collection of memorabilia honoring the Confederacy. The black woman working in the gift shop asked if I had any questions, but I didn't know where to start. One block from the Capitol, really the first structure after the government buildings, is the church where Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was pastor from 1954 to 1960. The fountain a few blocks down the street is a beautiful centerpiece for downtown Montgomery. Here is where the huge slave market was located, where Jefferson Davis processed to his inauguration where the Selma to Montgomery Voting Rights March ended, and where Rosa Parks got on the bus. She was removed a couple blocks later, where a museum in her name tells her story and that of the Montgomery bus boycott. The Freedom Riders Museum is in the original Greyhound bus station, where civil rights students, including future Representative John Lewis, were beaten by a white mob in 1961. The Equal Justice Initiative operates the Legacy Museum from enslavement to mass incarceration. It was packed with students and adults and the exhibit is brutal and brilliant. The Equal Justice Initiative also operates the National Memorial for Peace and Justice located a few blocks away overlooking Montgomery. The thousands of lynchings in the United States are memorialized through 800 county by county steel monuments with the names and dates of the victims. The circumstances of each lynching are listed along the walls as the monuments rise higher and higher into the air. Duplicate steel monuments are available for each county to receive. I agree with the times. One oddity, the downtown and government buildings were strangely quiet on a weekday. The swanky warehouse district bars and restaurants were pretty much empty, and there was no reason to check for cars when crossing the street. So I began a reverse march and headed towards Selma. Halfway, there's a good museum about the 1965 voting rights march. They seem to be expecting more people. It's strangely difficult to walk across the Selma Bridge. There's no sidewalk leading up to it, and there's no guardrail between the pedestrians and the cars whizzing by. Go figure, Selma. Then north to a cluster of towns around Muscle Shoals, which I always assumed because of the name was located down on the Gulf of Mexico. Oops.
The Miracle Worker is performed in the outdoor theater every year. Producer-songwriter Rick Hall started fame in 1959, and though it's still a sought-after recording studio, its heyday was in the 1960s and 70s, when artists like Aretha Franklin, Otis Redding, Percy Sledge, Etta James, Dwayne Allman, and later Tom Jones, the Osmonds, Mac Davis, and many others made iconic records here in the early days using the house band, The Swampers. The area is built up around the studio now, as my guide said, originally it was just a field filled with Osmonds. In 1969, the Swampers peeled off and started their own studio nearby, and in 10 years racked up sessions with the Rolling Stones, Bob Dylan, Elton John, Paul Simon, Rod Stewart, Cat Stevens, Willie Nelson, Liza Minnelli, and Cher. Trey, our guide, said the Swampers were coming in to record next week. This is the piano you hear on Freebird, Kodachrome, Leon Russell's Tightrope, and Bob Seeger's rock and roll that Tom Cruise danced to in Risky Business. Cher recorded her vocals in there, and Keith Richards sat on the toilet and wrote Wild Horses, the invoice for the Rolling Stones' Wild Horses session. Just across the Tennessee River, the father of the blues must be proud. A couple blocks away is one of the best examples of Frank Lloyd Wright's Usonian houses, designed for middle-class-ish incomes. Oh, that's not the entrance. It's the carport. This house was completed in 1940 for a Jewish family, the Rosenbaums. The elderly black gentleman who was my guide said that his father was a teacher and Mr. Rosenbaum was a lawyer on the school board, so they sometimes worked together in the 1950s and 60s. On what? I asked. Oh, issues of the day. A young woman removed to Oklahoma with the rest of her people during the Trail of Tears in the 1830s said she needed to hear the waters singing again and found her way back to the woodlands a few miles outside Muscle Shoals where she lived the rest of her life. Her great-great-great-grandson made it his life's work to honor her and other American Indians by building this contemplative memorial. The long haul north included navigating around the potholes of sadly depressed East St. Louis to get to the wonderful Overlook Park. And on day 11, through another snowstorm, home.